Good morning, everyone. Um, I have to say, I'm John Fell. I'm Deputy Director General of the Financial Stability Department at the ECB. Um, I've been asked to step, step into the chair for Stefan Ingves, and I have to say it's, it's quite a challenge to fill the shoes of Stefan in steering a discussion on MPLs, but I am honoured that he agreed that I step in for him in this panel. Uh, by the way, I'm told that Stefan is making a very good recovery from the flu. So now, before inviting the panellists to speak, I would like to make some, re some remarks on the work that is currently underway in Europe to tackle the almost one trillion euro stock of NPLs that is currently sitting on European balance sheets. And it's fair to say that there is a lot of work going on. Um, the SSM, as you know, issued guidance to banks on NPLs in March, and this is now being followed up actively um, with the banks. The EU Financial Services Committee issued a report on NPLs in May, and the ESRB published a report in July of an expert group on NPLs that I had the privilege to co-chair with Piers Haven um, of the EBA and also with the benefit of Stefan Ingves wisdom and guidance as chair of the advisory technical committee of the ESRB. Now, apart from all of these uh, official reports, a number of policy papers have also been published recently by, in by European institutions, including by ourselves at the ECB. So there are plenty of ideas circulating around about how to tackle the problem of NPLs. It's now expected that all of this work will be brought together into a concentrated effort over the coming year in view of the agreement that was reached in July of an EU Council action plan to tackle non-performing loans. Now, the perspective that we in the macroprudential policy and financial stability area of the ECB have tried to bring to the European debate on NPLs is a macroprudential one. And this perspective recognises when resolution of NPLs is too slow, it can lead to a host of externalities, including banking sector fragilities, that manifest in low profitability, elevating funding costs, and in a higher cost of capital. It can also lead to contagion, and a, a, a kind of contagion that not all financial market participants, except those working in NPLs, fully understand. A contagion through a weakening of the payment culture, which contaminates the performing book. And it usually also implies a misallocation of scarce financial resources, as funding and capital are tied up with unprofitable firms, while credit availability to productive ones is constrained. On the other hand, though, a resolution strategy that is too hasty, involving the seizing and liquidation of collateral, can also have adverse macrofinancial impacts, including the risks of fire sales and even the possibility that viable firms are liquidated in the process. Ultimately, this too may have adverse implications for economic activity and also for financial stability. So a balancing of these externalities essentially requires getting the pace of resolution right so that the maximum value can be extracted from non-performing loans without imposing strains on the financial system. Maximizing the NPV on NPLs, however, also depends, among other things, on the efficiency of the financial markets. Now, when the price mechanism leads to an inefficient allocation of goods and services, microeconomic theory teaches us that there is probably a market failure at work. One indication of market failure in the European NPL market is the very, is the very large bid-ask spreads between the prices that investors are, are prepared to pay for NPLs and the price that banks are prepared to sell them for. A typical gap of 10 to, of 10 to 20 percent is often cited, although it's not unusual to hear much larger figures than that. Another indicator of market failure is that most of the trading activity is in unsecured NPLs, often at very low prices, while liquidity in the market for higher quality NPLs is lower. Now, the fact that investors use, discount rates, use higher discount rates than banks do for valuing NPLs, it does have sound economic reasoning. For instance, NPL investors usually have a higher cost of capital than banks. They also have different contractual positions than banks do because of the timing of their entry into the contract. So, for instance, their discount rates will reflect the weakened credit worthiness of borrowers, whereas banks value the exposure at the originally contracted interest rate. However, after account is taken of all of those factors, our analysis suggests that the bid-ask spread is too wide. Now, identifying the market failures that explain that bid-ask spread is crucial for identifying the appropriate policy response. Three sources of market failure are normally distinguished in microeconomics textbooks, market failures arising from exchange costs, market failures arising from market structure, and market failures arising from the nature of the commodity itself. Now, our research at the ECB and our, also our dialogue with market participants has led us to the, the conclusion that for the NPL market, market failures actually arise in all of these three areas, with all of them working in the direction of widening the bid-ask spread. First, 
Concerning exchange costs, and I think this is the one that is best known, investors face asymmetric information challenges relative to better informed banks. In a special feature that we published in our Financial Stability Review last November, we characterized this in the framework of Akerlov's Market for Lemons conundrum, whereby investors demand a premium, reasonably so, to protect themselves from the uncertainty that better informed banks will try to sell them assets which have inferior credit quality than that that is being betrayed. Second, maybe a little, little bit more controversially, concerning the structure of the NPL market itself, our market intelligence has revealed that a handful of NPL investors control the bulk of the trading activity. In microeconomics, such a market structure, which arguably results from barriers to entry, and there are plenty of explanations for it, is labelled as an oligopsony, a situation where there is a concentration of market power among a limited number of buyers, which then pushes traded prices lower. And then third, concerning the nature of the commodity itself, NPLs are subject to so-called imperfect excludability. So say, for example, that a bank has an impaired loan with a, with a corporate or a commercial property developer, the likelihood is that the debtor has multiple creditors where some of the loans may be performing and some of them may not be performing. Now, a buyer of an impaired loan will often not have exclusive access to the resources of the debtor and so instead may have to compete with other creditors. Since this lack of coordination imposes costs on and creates risks for MPL investors, this too will push traded prices lower. And of course, this was an important element of the NAMA strategy when it absorbed loans in, in Ireland. Now, <clears throat> turning to the policy response, an important policy message from a speech um, that Vice President Constancio gave at the Bruegel think tank in February was that the extent of market failures and frictions can differ depending on the market and also on the asset class, which is why we at the ECB think it is unlikely that any single instrument will provide a magic bullet solution for Europe's NPL problems. This is the rationale for advocating what we have been calling a comprehensive solution for tackling the European NPL problem, deploying a range of policy instruments in a way where they are likely to be most effective. So between the, the well-known extremes of internal workout and direct sales, there's a range of options for tackling NPLs, and that includes, for instance, securitization, the establishment of asset management companies, and also the establishment of so-called NPL transaction platforms. Now, if effectively combined, we think together they could address these market failures that I mentioned. So on securitization, we published a proposal in the May issue of our Financial Stability Review, which utilizes Akerlov's policy prescription for the lemons problem. Not exactly in the way that Akerlov prescribed it, but kind of. It's the issuance of guarantees, but the guarantees in this case will be guarantees uh, <coughs> provided by the state on the junior tranches in NPL securitizations to provide comfort to investors on asset quality. Now, while securitization may address um, the asymmetric information and also possibly the oligopsony market failures because it probably would attract more investors, uh, a shortcoming of the approach, <coughs> we think, is that it is not clear if it can resolve the imperfect excludability problem that I mentioned. That, however, can be addressed with what we call systemic AMCs, asset management companies which have a major role to play. It's often under, understated the role that AMCs play in solving coordination problems when many banks are trying to tackle their NPL problems at the same time, just as NAMA did in Ireland and as Sarab did in Spain. Now, however, given state involvement in, in systemic AMCs, and I mean here the provision of, of, of finance and, and capital, uh, we're of the view that the, the asset perimeter in AMCs should be confined to asset classes where the risks of political interference are minimized, for instance, to commercial real estate loans or perhaps um, uh, corporate loans. Now, from a financial stability perspective, a narrow asset perimeter also makes sense to avoid um, an outside risky a AMC from being established, which may risk setting off a negative sovereign feedback loop. So, although AMCs do offer the prospect of addressing all three of the market failures that I mentioned, there are limits to their use. Now, also in, in Vice President Constancio's Bruegel speech, he called for the preparation of a European blueprint for AMCs to be used at national level. And this proposal has since been taken up by the EU Council conclusions and the task has been assigned uh, to the European Commission. And such a blueprint for national AMCs, as we see it, would essentially provide a how-to guide uh, for setting up an AMC, and moving away from the case-by-case -case approach that inevitably we saw in countries that applied for financial assistance programs during the crisis, while bringing together in a kind of a manual format a wide variety of information on, for instance, state aid rules, an accepted framework for valuing assets, advice on governance, and importantly, advice on the asset perimeter. 
Now, third, <clears throat> a third option that we're examining closely and on which our early work at the ECB also led, went into the conclusions of, uh, in the EU Council Action Plan is the establishment of so-called NPL transactions platforms. Now, these can be thought of as the eBay for NPLs, where information is shared and where transactions can take place. And, of course, such entities obviously can capture some of the benefits of AMCs, and they can also address asymmetric information issues and also oligopsony issues because there should be a broader investor base. At the same time, avoiding risks of political in interference. Um, similar to securitization, um, uh, th there, there may be issues around how to, how to deal with the imperfect excludability, but we're thinking about now that at the moment, and we will be coming out with something later in the year. Now, when markets fail, <clears throat> it's time for policy to act, and our conclusion is that policy needs to support greater transparency in NPL markets, foster wider investor participation, and help in addressing coordination issues. Now, while our proposals for deepening secondary markets have the potential, in our view, to reduce bid ask spreads significantly, there are, though, limits to how far they can be narrowed if nothing is done to speed up insolvency procedures and reducing the cost of <coughs> addressing NPLs. This is why our securitization proposal, for instance, advocates a financial structure where the state participates not only in providing not only making itself available for the risk to the downside, but also participating in the upside, thereby creating a financial incentive to engage in much needed structural reform. So <clears throat> with those few words and that preamble, let me now introduce our panel who collectively have accumulated a wealth of experience with NPLs from different vantage points. First, we have Aristobulo de Juan, who is a consultant and an expert with 50 years of experience in banking, I'm told, including 35 years in dealing with problem banks. Uh, Balin <coughs> Romana Garcia is currently a non-executive director at Aviva, an insurance and investment and asset management company. And But importantly for our panel, she formerly served as president of Sarab. Uh, so we have a unique vantage point on the AMC perspective. Davide Serra is the founder, chief executive officer and chief investment officer of the asset management firm Algebras. And, he's, and his firm is an active investor in the European NPL market. And last, but by no means least, we also have Ed Sibley, who is Deputy Governor at the Central Bank of Ireland, and as a member of the supervisory board of the single supervisory mechanism, he has considerable experience with NPL issues. Uh, <clears throat> the, speaking, the speaking order I have agreed with, with the panelists. It will follow the listing of names in the program, with each speaker having 10 minutes for their interventions, after which we will have a 20-minute discussion among the panel, and following that, conference participants will have a chance to pose questions to the panelists. But I am told that we need to, to, to close strictly at, at noon because we have then the, the keynote speech. So let me invite Aristobulo de Juan to take the floor. <coughs> Mr. Ingves, while he was office asked me to briefly introduce myself. Don't be afraid, I'll be very brief. <clears throat> After having 12 years in commercial banking, I spent 40 years in dealing with problem banks, hands-on, case by case. <clears throat> so I did that work not only in Spain but in four continents and I think I ended up learning something. Uh, I was responsible for the Spanish first insurance deposit guarantee, deposit insurance guarantee, the first bad bank, then responsible for banking supervision, then <coughs> advisor to the World Bank on banking reform, and then my own consulting practice. As a result of that, I, <coughs> my focus will be a macro, a micro approach, not a macro one. Of course, when I've seen 300 creatures, you become sort of macro too. <coughs> also, I tend to be down to earth, even sometimes simplistic, but that's what I've lived. And also like to play the devil's advocate. So I might sound like a being out of the outer world here. Now, <clears throat> when I was announced the name of this session, uh, I said, well, this is good news, a new effort to address the very important case of NPL. 
but I also thought it was bad news. Because after 10 years of crisis, the burden of NPLs are still there. And paradoxically, banks declare good regulatory capital. So I'm there to say that something leaves to be desired. <coughs> now, the background of my reflection, which contagiates the whole of my presentation, is that some have the impression that <coughs> a strong concern for stability is given priority over strict regulation and supervision. Some, I have some people speak about, we are facing beautiful normality. My answer is, the present situation is not beautiful or normal. <coughs> Why? Because for fear, regulators and supervisors, if this assumption was correct, which I don't put my hand on, on the Bible, <coughs> Uh, for fear of the potential consequences of being strict, short term, uh, on financial systems and on economies. It sounds like thinking, we do want to improve things, we do want to improve things, but not yet. Uh, now, but sh we should be aware that our present stability, paradoxically, is unstable. Mm. Excess liquidity, Karl Marx used to say that, that uh, religion was the opium of the people. I tend to say that excess liquidity is the opium of the banker. <coughs> it tends, the banker tends to forget about risk. Now, what were the circumstances in 2007? <coughs> There was excess liquidity. We now have excess liquidity. Uh, bubbles, the real estate bubble. Now we have the debt and high yield securities. And now we have the threat of Mr. Trump with lowering the regulation standards, which no doubt would have contagion effects in Europe. So a similar situation as 10 years ago. You can think of whatever you want. But other than that, we have an unresolved problem of non-performing loans and <coughs> big geopolitical stability. We are at war in many geographical points. So I leave the reflection to you. Now, <coughs> should we really be afraid of the consequences no, I think we should be strict <coughs> instead and deal with the problems head on. Otherwise, the consequences are likely to be worse. A worse crisis may come about, and in my opinion, sooner than later. What does it mean, sooner? Two years, three years, four years? <laughs> Now, just a few rules of thumb or reminders that are often disregarded by a number of supervisors. One problem is like those are my man manias, but based on my own white hair. <coughs> problem banks hide their problems. Do you know that? Are you familiar with that? but also systemic banks, because they become so powerful that they overwhelm the supervisors. They are stronger than the supervisors. Second, <coughs> regulation, if that is true, and, and that is true, <coughs> regulation and supervision will not be effective if based on unverified information. Not verification of procedures, but verification of quantities, estimation of loss. But this also applies to off-site analysts. I, their findings are not reliable to me. Auditors work, mm -hmm. models and tests, and AQR when they are not they are based on non-inspected, non-verified. 
uh, data. Otherwise, they are. Three, as a matter of fact, the worst loans, this is one of my main manias, the worst loans are never or seldom recorded as bust in the books or properly covered. They are never in arrears, they are never impaired, mm, they go free. <coughs> Four, cosmetics is mainly achieved by way of loan refinancing, both principal and interest. I don't say that financing is a bad practice, I mean bad loan refinancing. That's a bad practice. Five, this is very important, and it is not my own money, it's a fact. <coughs> A truism, non-performing loans do not perform. Should sure. non-performing loans. But their supporting liabilities do convey a cost and a cash outflow. So <coughs> they hurt the bank day after day. And this is something not to be forgotten. And it, I would say it's irrefutable. It's difficult to accept, but it's not difficult to understand. Six, borrowing does not fill the black hole. It has to be repaid, as simple as that. Seven, a forward-looking approach and a strengthening of good governance is more than welcome, are more than welcome. But the supervisor should mainly focus on the present, and on-site supervision should not be replaced by forward-looking approach. And last, but not least, who is to be blamed for the 10 years life of non-performing loans? The managers, the supervisors, and the regulators. Now, <coughs> what's my suggestion? My suggestion <coughs> does not exclude other mechanisms, of course. And we have representatives of other mechanisms on the table. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but why are not, uh, why NPL are not liquidated? Because they are not duly provisioned and liquidation would certainly unveil hidden losses and would also disturb dividends, bonuses, extravagant expenditure, and man management power, and social predominance. So let us be realistic. And the key thing is record real asset value in the book. In the books. How? By way of a thorough on-site case, by case on a thorough on-site, case-by-case, quantified inspections, not procedural inspections. Procedural inspections is also good, but not quantifying inspections. The real value of this is not good. This would require a turn of the screen. I, we were told yesterday that IFRS is a great progress. I'm not so sure. And in the question and answer period, I could tell the reasons. I think there is need for an IFRS 10. <coughs> we had BAL 1, BAL 2, BAL 3, BAL 4, BAL 7, who knows? Uh, it's cumbersome, it can be manipulated, but <coughs> capital increase, you cannot do every, every day, and you, it, it doesn't allow you to to be, how would I say, increasing capital every year, while provisions you increase as you identify the loss. So you stop the, the, the snowball from rolling. And in which areas? Dealing with expected losses, case by case, on-site supervision practices, case by case, Evaluation principles, fixed assets should be valued at market, loans should be valued according to the repayment capacity 
آقا آقا برو ام بد لونز فری فنانسین یس شود بی شود بی بد لونز ری فنانسین شود بی واتس تو آقا ویری گرفلی پروویسیون شود بی مندتری آلسو در آر ثری پرنسپل شود بی اپلاید این Current losses should be charged against P&L as provisions, so that you identify gradually the problem and you can digest. Mr. Garcia Cantera said that the Spanish banks couldn't provision because they didn't make profits. If they had started five years ago, they would have been able to. Uh, and do not charge current losses on reserve for capital. Then past stocks of losses belatedly unveiled should be charged on reserves or capital, whatever the impact. And capital should always be clean, not assigned to given expected losses. It welcome, you should welcome the inflow of cash, but um, don't consider that as regulatory capital. Uh, since I'm being told that it's my time is has come to an end, I say <coughs> that this may have a problem. It may unveil the failure of some banks. But other alternative formula options also may have to be financed by, by who? By whoever. The creators, the billing, the billing creators, the shareholders, the industry, and the government. Who were, and this is the end, who were <coughs> the most successful supervisors to solve the crisis? Those who acted promptly and injected government money. Perhaps, who knows, recapitalization and resolution rules may have to be revi revisited. And now I'll end up by repeating General MacArthur's saying, he said, the cause of most defeats can be summarized in two words, too late. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those insightful, insightful remarks. So next up um, would be Balin. Balin, please. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for inviting me in the first place and for the sake of transparency, I'm also a member of the board of Santander. It's not only Aviva, I also work with Santander. So um, I'll try to be quite brief. I don't see my time there. Yeah. Um, but I have sort of three key messages, I would say. One is, the first one being, uh, there is no silver bullet to solve NPL's problem. The second one, this is not only about banks. Um, and I'll come back to that. And the third one is uh, technology exists and do you remember big data? Because I think that we should also talk about that. So on the first point, um, there's no silver bullet. Um, you know, I'm quite familiar with the, with the um, uh, Spanish case, so that's uh, the basis of my reasoning. But it's quite evident, I think, that this is a very complex issue, so it needs a sort of a range of things. In our case, we had increased provisions, mandatory, on NPLs and on performing loans, both. We had an external valuation, a third party valuation. We had disclosure and transparency rules on, um, on, on very specific pools of assets, mainly uh, the real estate uh, related assets. Um, we also had a focus on, on refinance loans. Um, we strengthened the insolvency law, and then we had our AMC. So I think that that brought Spain to a quite different uh, position. If you uh, remember uh, the graphs that we have just seen on, on where we are, and if you remember wh where we were, uh, the change has been uh, swift. But again, there's a list of things. Uh, maybe I'm biased, I'm, 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 no, I'm biased, but I think one of the key things was the AMC. And if you compare the evolution of NPLs in the countries with 
reasonably successful AMCs, being that uh, Ireland and Spain, compared to others like Italy, you see that, that the evolution of non-performing performing loans has been quite different. <laughs> so my, that, that was my first message. The second one is, um, this is not only about banks. It starts with banks, but we have to take into account a, a, a wide range of agents when dealing with uh, NPLs. Starting with the process, um, the process has a certain goal, which is stabilize the financial system and clean up the, the bank's balance sheets. But the goals of the other agents are quite different. Take the AMC. The goal of the AMC is buy the assets as cheap as possible and manage them as efficiently as possible and then sell them at the highest possible price. So the goals are quite different. Um, and back to your point on market failures, I do think that, that the AMC addresses some or many of the market failures uh, surrounding um, NPLs. So on the AMC, when do you have to, to get started? Um, that's, that would be my first point. I think when markets stop believing what, what the banks say about their non-performing loans, that should be the starting point. The second one is, which loans? Uh, one of the big problems with NPLs, from my point of view, it's it, it may be um, an evolving concept. So you start with a performing loan, and when does it become a non-performing loan, and will it become a non-performing loan? That would be um, the first problem. In our case, what we did was identify an asset class, which is uh, real estate. It was maybe easy, because we have had um, uh, a bubble, but I think that that was key in the sense that it, we did not, the AMC did not receive only non-performing loans. It did receive all the loans surrounding a certain class of asset and debtors, which addresses two of your points in terms of, of market failures, because we did have a fairly good view of a debtor. We had many positions with that uh, uh, company, which of course, uh, helped us trying to deal uh, with, with him and, and gave us some sort of bargaining power. So it gives you two things. One is bargaining power, and the second thing is, of course, you can, with your own balance sheet as an AMC, you can uh, balance out the, the, the positions that, that will be loss-making with positions that will be earning, earnings-making. So I think that's something that, from the point of view of the bank, transferring or selling the assets is not the, the best point. But back to it, this is not only about banks. We should try to create AMCs that are standalone uh, profitable and may survive on their own in the coming years, not only when, when the whole thing starts. The third point with AMCs is, is, is of course, price, which is the key thing around uh, conflicts of interest. You, want, you As an AMC, you want to buy as cheap as possible as a bank you want to sell bad assets as a highest possible price. So I think that, that at that point, you need either two things. One, a third party or bargaining power in both parts. So the AMC should have also bargaining uh, power. And then uh, there's the third point, which is how. And, and I think that's, that's key. And we usually never talk about that, which is the operational side of it. The problem that an AMC has is it does not have a platform and banking pl platforms are not sold. You cannot buy a banking platform, and you need it, because you have to manage your assets, which are, by the way, banking assets. So in terms of um, operationally, it is very, I think, delicate and key. If it does not work, then no matter what price you get, it won't work. There are different models. Uh, you have the internal model in Germany, the external in Spain, and the mix in Ireland. I won't get into that, uh, but I think that's something key. It's not only about the assets, it's how you will manage them the day after. And then my final thing on, on, on the AMC is that it's human resources. It is a very specific animal. Um, knowing when you're gonna die makes a huge difference. And it's, it's quite difficult to attract people when they know that they will have a very uh, well-defined life within a company, they won't be able to grow the company, they won't be able to create new, mar new markets, new services, new assets. So that, that creates a very specific problem. 
So that's for the AMC. And then we have the buyers and the market. Um, as you said, mm, the NPL market in Europe is controlled by a very, very uh, narrow number of agents. And that has to do with, I think, a few things. One is the problem with, um, with information and the problem with liquidity. There are no good markets that, that give liquidity to, to loans, to NPLs. In fact, what, what, what we could see in, 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 the, in the Spanish case was it was easier, much easier to sell real estate assets than loans. And that, that is because they are much more liquid. You have a market, you can, um, they are easily priced, you have buyers and sellers. It's a, you, ha you do have a liquid market. Whereas in the case of NPLs, you don't have liquid markets, um, structured markets, secondary markets. It's difficult to value, uh, to value those, those assets. Um, you do, you, not that many uh, companies or institutions can buy assets in, in terms of loans. What, what can, I mean, how can they manage them? How can they uh, bar bargain? So the, I think that, that creating a real market for NPLs and loans, by the way, uh, would be uh, key. Uh, if we, if we want to widen up uh, this, this sort of um, activity. And then servicers. We don't talk about them, but they are key. Um, if you do need a servicing industry that is outside the banks. You have that in the US, for example. Uh, in, in Spain, we, ha we now have a servicing industry outside uh, the banking world. But I think that's, that's another key point when if you want to make this work in the ongoing uh, process, not when you start and when you create the AMC and when you clean up the bank, that's fine, but then you have to think onwards. And th that was my second message. The third one is, is technology. Um, I think that that will change materially how we deal with, uh, with this because of a few things, because of big, big data and predictive analytics. The key point with NPL is when you want to price an NPL, uh, will the guy pay me back? How can I know that? And I think that, that, that the, um, the development of analytics and big data and predictability will help us understand much better who and how can a guy pay you back. And that's key both for banks and for non-banks. Um, and uh, creating a pool of data and, 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 and a pool of instruments that help you decide who to address when you want to decide which debtors should, should you start with first is, is key. So I will be compliant with the time. And, um, and, and I'll just go back to my uh, three messages, which is uh, there's no silver bullet. There's no one thing you can do to solve it all. Uh, whatever we pick, it won't be the wrong one. So we, we need a combination of things. The second one, this is not only about banks. Let's think about what happens afterwards, not only how to make it work at the beginning. And I say that because I suffer this lack of, of understanding sometimes. And that technology will, will change, I think, materially, um, all this business. Um, and that was it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Berlin, for those very insightful <laughs> remarks. OK, uh, Davide, please. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, so let me tell you my first experience on non-performing loan. I'm 24 years old. I'm graduate in a UK bank, SG Warburg, and the Italian Treasury, back then with Mario Draghi as head, hires the bank for which I was working to value uh, Banco di Sicilia, which is uh, a bank that in 1996 has a 40% non-performing loan ratio. Um, as a young kid, I was studying the tequila crisis, it was happening back then, and so I got catapulted in Palermo. I've never been in Sicily in my life. I was born in uh, Milan, and at the age of 20, I left for Brussels and London. And there I understood the reality of non-performing loan. Um, because basically, you have to, uh, for the first time, take a file and understand. I had no idea what NPL meant, yeah? So what is it? So you give money to someone, he hasn't paid back. OK, why? And then you started running numbers. Four years ago, as uh, I moved from an analyst to investor, um, 
we are one of the largest investors globally in hybrid capital in financials. We run 12 billion euro just in financials. And then four years ago, um, the couple of my investors told me, can you invest in Italian non-performing loans? I said, listen, I have no idea, no interest. Please look at the market. And so then what I did, I actually uh, did the hard work, which I advise all of you to do. So first, before someone comes with a solution from a policymakers and hasn't seen what a physical non-performing loan means, please don't do policy. Okay? And I've seen this several times. So what I did, for example, we, I went to visit about 40 loans. What do you mean visit? If there is a collateral, you need to go and see the collateral. You need to understand what it is. And I understood one thing. Non-performing loan can have negative value. I'll give an example. Italy lost 25% of industrial production. If you have an industrial building and you have asbestos problem and someone says, do you want to take this building for free? You should say no because the building has negative value. So non-performing loan can have negative value. Secondly, the uh, theme behind the uh, uh, MPL, which ultimately is um, what we think, it's all about time value. Italy, I think, has done uh, something which is unique. You know, you have a country that is uh, prudent in its lending. Suddenly, GDP minus 10 and 25% of industrial production gets wiped out. Clearly, you have a massive macroeconomic issue. And so even what were, in my view, considered as good loans at the time you made it, suddenly become problematic. Now, at that point, time is of the essence. That's the key message I give you. Why? Because something that deteriorates at the beginning, you need immediately to intervene. And here are a couple of big issues. First, in banking structurally, that's what I've analyzed, if you are in Santander, Unicredo, Entesa, and you have 100,000 employees, as a CEO, I can tell you, you never sent your best people in the MPL division. Because the MPL division is when you lend the money and the money has been lost. Yeah? So no one is client-facing. You're basically dealing with you know, the garbage. And so what happens? Do you think the best people in Santander or Entesa, Unicredo do not go and deal with the garbage? No, nobody wants. Okay? So what happens is when the problem of MPL becomes the biggest portion of your equity, you got a problem. You have not allocated your Navy SEALs yeah, to deal with it. You know, they are in the asset management, they are in banking, they are in finance division. You just left you know, whatever employees that you didn't want to promote it. That's a big issue. The secondly, and that's what I've noticed, the second issue is within the MPL stock, uh, you have three types, basically. Think simplistic. The one that can be dealt statistically, big data. Uh, provision that five cents in a dollar, yeah, bills, Nannies, not paid, that's statistics. There are platforms, it's easy, you make a phone call, you know, they're worth five cents in a dollar, and basically, statistically, you can make money. There, I think the, in, the industry works in most countries, um, it's easy, all small tickets. As a result, you have diversified risk. The most troublesome are the corporate loans. Why? Corporate loans, if I'm making ties and I go bankrupt, and for four years I lost all my employees, I have no patents. My machinery is old, and you think there is collateral value behind it, and you're dreaming. And then when you get into it, you have the three layers of problems. You have the corporate entity, you have the rights of the workers, you have pension liability, yeah? And so what happens is the complexity is too high. So there, in my view, as a policy, I think what every country should facilitate, it's an early debt for equity swap which is why in the US, ultimately, there is higher recovery. Meaning as soon as the company gets into trouble, there has to be a way whereby you can easily convert that into equity. I didn't know all this, but in Italy, it was still illegal because the framework of the bankruptcy law was set up at the Mussolini days. Back then, Mussolini you know, was a dictatorship. So if you went bankrupt, because it was a fraud, you were stealing money because prices were all uh, agreed uh, from the central government. And so what happens, you need to adjust your bankruptcy code. Today, given the technological changes, good entrepreneurs can go bankrupt in good faith. And you need to find a quick way to move debt into equity to, to basically protect what is available. Um, Italy, in this way, has done massive reforms over the last four years. I mentioned some. Some make me laugh, but I think they're key. In order to accelerate time to action. The first one is Italian courts used to close 45 days in summer. They take it easy. The government said, hey, 45 days of holidays, too long, you know, shrink it to 30 days. Secondly, there was a stamp duty 
So every time you try to buy a loan, you need to pay 9% of the value. Clearly, that alone you know, is a huge tax. Third, the, um, because of the way you hold collateral, very few people can actually buy non-performing loans. You need to be regulated. And so guess what? You know, there are very few people which are regulated. Last but not least, in order, and something you mentioned before in Spain, which I think is key, you need to keep a healthy industry that can buy non-performing loans at all times. It's a bit like having the fire brigade. If you never have any fire for 10 years, your fire brigade ain't good. If they have a fire every day, they keep on track. When regulators and bankers say, we don't have any problem with non-performing loans for 10 years, happened in Italy, what happened? You didn't have a healthy ecosystem when you had to sell them. Because for 10 years, nobody could make a living investing in non-performing loans. It's as simple as that. And so all of a sudden, you say, now we want to sell it. Well, there's no problem. There's nobody can, can buy it. Nobody even knows how to buy it, yeah? let alone the capital. Capital is not an issue. It's be able to do the job. Then my last experience. So it's a question of numbers. So we have about 120 people. We deployed a billion euro of equity in Italy, non-performing loan real estate, more than anybody else. And we started three years ago. I didn't even know how to spell it out. So the issue is, it's easy, do the hard work. So I went to Moped, I went to see the commercial agents, I understood the value chain, um, we invested in IT, average age of the people I have is 33, yeah? So uh, embrace IT, uh, need to get young guys. And what I realized is actually there is a good way of uh, achieving recovery, but it's very linked in our case to the real estate sector because that's the easy one. Yeah? Nobody is a rocket scientist. Uh, so I decided to invest in the easiest, and that's real estate from legal entity. So I don't have any social issue. I only buy a loan when there is a legal entity so that the court goes fast. Yeah? We're not kicking out any individual. Legal entity cannot cry in court. And it's all about the speed. So let me tell you why when I hear there's a difference between market prices. So as a bank, if you have a 15% capital, tier one, 35 bonds and 50 deposits, which is the average bank in Europe, you have a weighted average cost of capital of financing of 2% today. When people give me capital, yeah, they want at least 10% back. Okay, that's an 8% difference per year. So if the average Italian court in the north, it takes two years, that's the fastest, yeah? You need to be stars. It's gonna take you, there is a 15% gap if you go in Sicily and it takes 10 years, then there is an 80% gap. So even if someone gives you an asset because it's gonna take you eight years to take it, the cost of capital differential means it's worthless. So the first thing the government and policy maker need to do is speed up the core system. It's a, think about it, an MPL is something has gone bad. You take the guy immediately into hospital because if you let it bleed, time is only gonna make it worse. And my advice, hence to policymaker, is concentrate on the speed of the action court, speed at which the banks deal with it, because any time you hide it and you buy time, you're only going to make it worse. Last but not least, the idea of having listed eBay system, forget it. So why does technology work with Amazon or eBay? Because if I want to buy an iPhone yeah, or you know, anything, it's equal. Everybody knows what it is. Then you create a market. I've analyzed 6,000 loans. It took me four years, yeah? And I can tell you, each loan is different from the other. Each house, in each, you know, if you go in Milano, which is each different apartment is different. So the idea that you can make an eBay platform out of it is just a joke. And the idea that when you use a rating agency, yeah, to analyze and give a rating after they defaulted on $1 trillion of US loans in America, yeah, on AAA, and you think that as an investor, I'm gonna believe in the rating, yeah, you're dreaming. So my view is incentivize speed of action on the legal point of view and make it faster because that gap in prices is the only thing that's going to make it faster. Last point, asset management company, public, be aware of it. I was 24 years old. Banco di Napoli's bad bank was set up, 1997. It still exists today, 20 years later. It has hired 1,200 people, so that's a good social way of uh, giving people jobs has recovered virtually nothing. So it's fantastic because nobody has complained, because nobody has been foreclosed. The social cost to taxpayer, it's huge. So the idea of now uh, bypassing 
uh, let's say, what needs to be done by creating big asset management company is very risky. Ireland and Spain are two unique cases. GDP did 190 and then did 900 very fast. So suddenly the macroeconomic recovery with proper alignment worked very well. If this doesn't happen, watch out. And that's my last comment. <laughs> well, th thank you very much, David. I, I think we agree on almost everything, but I have to tell you, it's, it's not often that I'm told that a policy proposal that I make is a joke. <laughs> no. um, and no. I just, I mean, just, maybe just, uh, I mean, I sometimes wonder when I, you know, I hear very different views on this depending on whether I'm talking to a bank or whether I'm talking to an investor. And I'd, I'm always curious to know why investors are not keen, that is, people who are already in the business are not keen on the platform. Whereas the banks that I talk to seem to think that it has the potential to be uh, very positive for, for, um, for enhancing liquidity in the market. Yeah, uh, it's very simple. So the bank has a financing. So if I need to hold this and there's no water, it costs me 2% as a bank. So they hope by doing an asset management company, then, then public money goes in it. And so public money has no accountability. First is great, you're going to hire lots of people. Yeah, you're going to hire regulators, you're going to hire IT, so it's public employees. And every politician wants to hire public employees. They just get jobs for the next election. Secondly, they hope that government funding goes in it. In Italy, it's called Atlante. Uh, they tried with GAX. You know, there's different names. Basically, subsidize it. So the issue is, I want to know who, uh, with their own savings, wants to go. And, you know, I'll show you a couple of MPLs. Each of you buy one, small, and then go and try to recover it. And then you realize that, you know, maybe you want to buy U.S. Treasury at 2.5% mm -hmm. to sleep at night. Because the effort, yeah, between how much work you need to do and how much you make is such a difference that you need to understand this. And, um, and that's the reason why banks have a huge incentive. Why do they want it? Because they hope eventually we're going to dump it on the public at a subsidized <laughs> rate. So. Okay, David, you, you delivered exactly what we expected. Thank you very much for that. Um, so um, could I invite now uh, Ed, Ed Sibley uh, to take the floor? Uh, thanks. Thanks, John. Um, in, in my remarks uh, today, which will, will be published um, uh, in full on the, on the Central Bank website, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on actually some of the issues that have already been discussed in, the, in, in this panel and, and, and the previous one. Um, I'm not going to talk much about the, the, the problem itself. I think that's well, well understood, but I will, will touch on it. Um, uh, I'm going to recall mainly the, the, the Irish experience, and I've got one slide um, that will um, uh, help to illustrate that. And then I'll try and draw together some, some, some key lessons from the Irish experience for, for what is a, uh, a European problem. Um, just in terms of um, uh, the problem itself, as, as, as I see it, um, clearly NPLs cause a, um, a significant dysfunction in, in the banking system, um, and it re they, they really do hinder uh, the banking system fulfilling its purpose uh, in terms of serving the economy and also serving its customers. Um, and part of the reason for that is a breakdown in trust in how the system works. Um, and when we talk about trust, um, maybe p people think about that as being a bit intangible, um, but there are absolutely quantifiable impacts. Um, and again, we've, we, we've heard a little bit about some of that or, or already today. But we see it trust in term, mistrust in terms of investors and unwillingness to in invest in banks, uh, impacting on price to book values. Uh, we see mistrust in, in um, uh, the banks themselves, and we saw earlier a slide around net interest margin. Um, we see higher interest rates where banks don't trust borrowers to repay or they don't trust the system in terms of an ability to um, uh, affect security. And we also see mistrust in terms of uh, banks' uh, willingness to operate on a cross-border basis, and that is impacting in terms of consolidation in the system. Uh, it's, so, it's so important, therefore, that uh, the authorities, and including in that the regulators and supervisors, uh, are brave and they take action to try and restore some of that trust, to take action to uh, uh, address the underlying issues. We hear a lot about financial stability uh, issues in terms of addressing NPLs. We hear a little bit less about consumer protection um, and borrower protection uh, issues. I think they are, they are important. Um, uh, if we think about uh, uh, poor borrower uh, outcomes, then ultimately that will lead to poor prudential outcomes too. Um, if I can turn then to, to the Irish experience, the, 
Uh, Irish banking system has gone through a couple of major transformations in the last 15 years. Um, from 2003 to 2008, um, the uh, system grew by, or the domestic banking system grew by more than three times. It was blown up by, um, mostly by real estate lending, um, a, a, a weak and in some cases completely absent uh, underwriting um, uh, management. Um, and ultimately unsustainable business models. Um, and when that, uh, the, the, uh, the, the global financial crisis hit, um, uh, those business models uh, collapsed, and ultimately the Irish domestic banks lost 68 billion um, uh, euros between 2008 and 2012. And NPLs uh, emerged and peaked in uh, 2013. Uh, Andrea talked a, a little earlier about the, um, the, the, the graph in, graphs in, in the US um, in terms of up and down NPLs um, and Japan. This is the, the, the Irish uh, version. Um, I won't spend any time, any time talking about AMCs, but I would note um, that NAMA is definitely, that the Irish uh, AMC was definitely part of the solution, but the loans that were transferred to NAMA, commercial real estate loans, were transferred in 2011 and NPLs peaked in Ireland more than two years later. So NAMA was definitely part of the solution, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't all of the solution. It wasn't all about uh, all the, the impacts that have, that have driven down NPLs over that period. What this, what this graph shows us at, at a very high level, and I appreciate there's, a, there's some acronyms and, uh, which you probably, not all of you will understand, um, is over, over an extended period, um, the authorities had to take sustained um, increasingly prescriptive uh, action to try and address NPLs in, in Ireland um, and that there was a lag, a considerable lag uh, between the actions being taken and the, the effect of those actions. Um, and if we, if we look at it as a continuum of, of measures, we have started with um, making sure that the banks were adequately capitalised to deal with the issue, that they were recognising the problem um, in terms of recognizing uh, non-performing loans, that they were then providing for them uh, uh, adequately. And you can see in there that we, we, we went beyond, well, uh, well, certainly to the edge of our remit in terms of uh, insisting on <coughs> adequate and conservative provisioning. Um, uh, and then we went into the strategies for dealing with NPLs and the operational capabilities. Some of this has already been uh, touched on this morning. Um, and then we did it all again. Um, so we continually challenged um, and sought to, to, to drive the banking system to, ad to address the problems that, that, that were in it. Um, all these were underpinned by con uh, borrower protection measures um, to make sure that borrowers were not um, uh, significantly disadvantaged by, 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 the, by, by the issue. Um, and so what, what do we see in terms of, um, in terms of outcome? As I said, we, we peaked in late uh, 2013. There's uh, uh, 14 consecutive quarters of, of reduction in, in, in NPLs. Um, that's a 50, 50 billion drop, um, or 60, around 60%. The graph somewhat understates the, 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 the movement um, in that at this, uh, from a ratio perspective, was at the same time there was very significant deleveraging uh, happening in the Irish banking system of both good and bad loans. Um, uh, so the, 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 the graph perhaps could, in, in, in those terms, would be, would be sharper. Um, we've talked uh, already about sales and some of the problems associated with sales. Um, now, sales have been part of the solution in, in Ireland, both to, to the asset management vehicle and also into, the, in, into uh, private investors. But it's really important to note that a lot of this work has been done through what I would call the really hard yards of engaging with borrowers, working out um, on, a, on a cohort by cohort basis, um, restructuring, resizing loans, affecting security to the extent necessary and possible, and there are limitations in the system there. Um, what we haven't seen enough of to date um, in Ireland, and I would say more broadly, is the use of the balance sheet and balance sheet write-off to try and actually reflect some of the economic reality around some of the collectability of, 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 of these loans. We can see from a, a European perspective that a lot of the things that, have, that took place in Ireland are being, uh, are being uh, used in, uh, across Europe. Um, uh, when the ECB and the SSM uh, commenced, their first action 
uh, was to do a comprehensive assessment, which would inclu include an asset quality review and to make sure there was sufficient, or try to make sure there was sufficient capital in the system to deal with the problem. Um, but the banking system, as it was in Ireland, the response from the banking system has been wholly inadequate uh, um, and, and, and largely disappointing. So the, the SSM, as we had to do in Ireland, um, has, sought, has had to challenge the banks, challenge them hard in terms of uh, their strategies, their capabilities, their willingness to address N N N NPLs. Um, and now are taking, as we did in Ireland, more prescriptive action. Um, and we've seen that recently with the uh, issuance of the ECB NPL guidelines, which really get at strategy, um, uh, the operational capability, and really the willingness of banks to, uh, to address this problem. So just uh, if I uh, uh, fi finish up with the, the three lessons I would, I would draw um, from Ireland that I think are, are particularly relevant from a, a European perspective. Uh, firstly, um, banks are not incentivized on an individual basis to deal with this issue. Um, uh, if we're left to their own devices, and there's very, very strong evidence of this, it will not be fixed. Um, now, there's actually, that makes a degree of sense on an individual bank basis, but it causes a very significant systemic issue, um, and that's where the authorities, including the supervisors, need to step in and drive home that this needs to be fixed. Um, secondly, um, and this is similar to, to, to Bellin's point, um, no single measure is going to fix the problem. Um, there are a number of measures that need to be taken, need to be taken from a supervisory perspective, from a structural perspective, from a policy perspective that will help to, uh, the, that will help to address it and this will take, does take time. So sales seem a little bit like a silver bullet and in some cases as we heard from Santander it's, they, they may be easier to affect um, but they are not going to be the, the solution for all the NPLs that sit in the system. And finally, um, the build-up of these problems actually takes place ve in, over a very short period. So the majority of, of NPLs that we have in, in Ireland now, which are, are largely uh, mortgages, um, 10 years since the, um, the onset of the crisis, were written in the last couple of years of the bubble years. So it's very, very quick these problems get built up in the system. It takes a very long time to, to, to fix them, which is why from a supervisory perspective, that, that continued uh, vigilance and intensity of supervision around underwriting practices, around business models, around capital and funding adequacy is absolutely critical. So I'll finish there, um, and I look forward to the discussion. Okay, thank you very much, Ed. I mean, so I mean, I talk. I mean, from this panel, I mean, okay, there were. I mean, as we as we hope for. I mean, differences of, differences of of, uh, of view. Um, but I think one theme that definitely comes through from all of your, your presentations is the importance when we're looking at things from a macro perspective, we also need to be very aware of the micro. And I think, David, in particular, you, you really emphasized how, how micro um, we need to get. Um, so because, of the, because we only have 20 minutes left, and I think we're going to be live streaming the, the, the speech. That's why we are str on, the, we're on this very strict time. I, I will invite the speakers um, to uh, respond to one another, but I would also pose at the same time a couple of questions um, to you um, as well, just two. Um, so, I mean, the first, I mean, I have to take advantage of the fact that we have um, representatives from Ireland and Spain on the panel, two countries that have seen measured success in reducing NPLs, and it precisely relates to that point. What exactly uh, were the key success, success factors in your cases? What lessons can we learn uh, for the broader Euro area endeavor, European endeavor that we're going to go into? Was it the unique starting point conditions that each of your countries found themselves in? where the commonalities and the challenge are in the policy approach to tackle it. For exa example, you didn't mention it, but there was also involvement of external agencies in the, res in, in the resolving of the NPL issues in, in your countries. The Troika, for instance, did it play a positive role? I would mention uh, that I, uh, you may be aware that I was myself a member of the Troika teams in both of your countries, so I'm interested to hear um, your answers on that. <laughs> And what lessons can be learned for countries that are facing the same policy challenges today, um, although in a different uh, context? So that's one group of questions. And then the other, and it's a bit also, I think David uh, really emphasized um, the importance of you know, really getting into the loan files and really understanding what, is, you know, what, what exactly it is um, that you're investing in. I mean, and this is where I have some credit. There were commonalities in the Irish and the Spanish experiences, in particular a major part of the NPL problem in both of your countries concerned commercial real estate and uh, development loans. 
That's a bit simplistic, I know, but in the interest of time. But this is not necessarily the situation that we're seeing in countries that are confronted with high NPL stocks today. Um, so for example, the SME portfolio, the non-performing SME portfolio is relatively large in some countries, and Davide has explained to us, I mean, how difficult it is to go to analyze that. Um, so what insights um, do you could you offer in terms of addressing high NPLs of those particular asset classes? Um, and how successful have you been in, in addressing these issues? Because we know that there have been big successes on the commercial real estate side, but I think there were also issues. There. Not necessarily for the two of you, I'd be interested to hear, um, and, and I see Aristibulo wants to get in, so uh, I'll start with you, Aristibulo, if you want, if you've got some reactions to some, of the, or, or indeed to the, um, the, the presentations of the colleagues. I think uh, the treatment of the Spanish crisis this time was unsuccessful. 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 But <clears throat> this is not an old battle. This is not an old battle, but I'll have to say it. In the 80s, it was what I considered a success. <coughs> Why? The, from six examiners, we were able to examine the quality of the borrower. We passed to 200 in a little more than two years. Those peoples were ready to identify the real size themselves, not auditors, analysts, or whatever. They went in, dirtied their hands, and so on. And out of 60 banks, three had enough assets to pay out the liabilities, the other 53 were sold out satisfactorily with no residives and no claims from the buyers. What was the heterodoxical problem? But it worked finally. <coughs> Who paid for the bill? We are now obsessed to, to pay for the burial. How much should be paid for the burial? And who should pay for the burial? Who should worry about not having burials? <laughs> but that's not the case. Uh, and now, <clears throat> uh, there was a full awareness that there was a loss. And the loss is a loss. A hole is a hole. It has to be covered somewhere. It doesn't disappear by magics. So it was fully covered. 50 50 by the government and the industry. And it worked nicely. No recidives, a, a few mergers, and no claims about a bad diagnosis to be. Mm -hmm. Now, <coughs> uh, well, I think that's my answer. I'll just make a comment why I think, for example, the difference between Ireland, Spain, Italy. So, first, Ireland and Spain. They raise their hands. Sorry, we got a problem. 10% of GDP. Secondly, oh shit, we don't have enough money to pay for it. So money in the European stability mechanism. So suddenly, change of governance. People came. Klaus Regling, its team, IMF, ECB. People went in. So suddenly, the guy that made the loan was not in charge any longer. The board, the guy that got paid, the regulator that protected the lawyers, out. You send foreigners in. They come in, they look at the situation. Quick reaction, a loss is a loss. Time of action, you save whatever can be saved and recover. Give a second example, Italy. They come in, it says, we don't got any problem. We have no problem, but there's been the policy written and signed for several years. It's still 10% of GDP. And it's inevitable because when your industrial production shrinks by 25, which was happening by 29, yeah, not even if you're Superman, yeah, you can recover SME loans. It's just impossible. So what happens is, in my view, for example, Italy should have raised their hands. Then there would have been a quicker change in corporate governance. So all the boards of Vicenza, uh, Veneto, which had no equity, they were lending money for you to buy stocks. I mean, there was no equity. Under Italian law, it's a criminal act to lend money for you to buy shares, because basically there's no equity. And no, but what I'm saying is, these guys have been doing it for 20 years. So clearly, there has been a failure by someone, by the local authority, by... 
the, it's called the uh, financiamento soci. And um, it's illegal, criminal, and these guys were doing it. So what happens? Had then when the ECB came in, suddenly they realized it all of a sudden. And so hence my experience is when there is an MPL crisis, you gotta go in fast and change the corporate account, the corporate governance of everyone. Managers first, it's always a, you know, a bank's problem. The key problem lies with the manager, the board, and often the shareholders. Like in the case of Spain, shareholders, big property developer, bought shares to lend money to themselves. Well, the same happened, I can tell you, in Veneto and Vicenza. Happened in Monte Paschi. So the first is a change in common governance because then at that point, you can actually intervene. And then you intervene, you save what is savable. But there's no magic, you know, there's no Steve Jobs in NPL, yeah? There's no Apple, there's no Google. It's hard work, real economy, because you have thousands and thousands of just real economy loans. That's my advice. Okay, thank you for that. Belen, uh, Ed, do you want to address any of those points? Um, well, I do think that we were successful, I must say. But, um, and, and, and the, key, the key thing, I think it's, again, um, for me, it, there's, it, there's only one word, which is, which is credibility. You only mm -hmm. you are only successful when you get to uh, okay, others believe that what what you go for it and you really go for it, and I think that in our case we did go for it and it was not easy and and that was a huge issue for us when we started with the AMC, and we started dealing with from debtors to potential buyers. No one thought we would do anything seriously because they thought we were too weak. Um, so debtors thought that we were not we would not go for that because we could have political issues. Potential buyers thought, you are gonna die in any case, so I'll sit and watch how you die and then I'll go and buy for free. So for us, the key thing is have a combination of, of decisions and uh, a real strong stand in terms of we're doing it and it's for real and, and we have to survive in the long run, so we're not gonna do anything stupid in the short run because it may be difficult. So for me, that's the key. When others start believing that you go for real, and that entails a long list of things, but that is the, the one. Uh, okay, um, thank you for that, Ed. Yeah. I'd, I'd ag agree with both those interventions. So uh, uh, early recognition, early action, persist persistence, and a variety of measures. Um, that there, is, there is nothing to substitute the hard work of getting through the loans, whether it's done by the banks, whether it's done by an asset management vehicle, or whether it's done outside the banking system. Um, those, those loans don't disappear, they still need to be worked. Um, and so that, that I think, is, is, is critically important, as is the, 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 the point around um, that isn't, there isn't one solution. Um, uh, we, we, we need multiple. Yeah. And I, I would, I, I would um, finish up just by noting that while the trajectory is very good in Spain and very good in Ireland, um, rel relatively speaking to the rest of the rest of the uh, EU, um, it's not like we're out of the woods. Um, so NPLs or um, foreclosed assets, m more problematic in, Sp in, in Spain, they're still there. Um, they're still too high. They still need action and determination. Uh, I don't think we can claim victory yet. Thank you, Ed. Ed one Just one Ed. comment I cannot mm. resist on uh, something David has said. Um, you said that, that, that it's always the worst people that go to solve the problem. I cannot um, agree with that since I was um, <laughs> but I was one of those ones. But, uh, but one thing that, that, I, that I would ask any, everyone to say, do not call it bad bank because it's the worst horrible thing you can do to create something and call it bad something, whatever <laughs> then you did. Uh, historically, inside the bank, Yes, people right, going, you know, they'll send you an investment bank, yeah. asset management and sales, yeah. and then if you are a, a good bureaucrat, they send you an NPL. It's only when it becomes the core business mm -hmm. that then you have a problem. Okay. Why? Because even if you take the super McKinsey guy, and the guy hasn't done anything for 20 years, before he gets there, it takes him three years to learn, mm -hmm. and three years in NPL, it's a 25% hit to your gross book. Because of the leverage of a bank, one to 15, yeah? You just do the math, it's basic arithmetic, that's why I think it's key the regulators keep on forcing banks to sell NPL because you need to keep people that can come and intervene. If not, when you arrive after 15 years and say, oh, sorry, we've got an NPL problem, then there's no one to treat it. And then the only way is taxpayer or, uh, you know, full bail-in. Bail-in, remember, these are all taxpayers, yeah? 
in bank, you know, within a bank capital structure, even uh, loan bonds are only bought by someone eventually who's a retail. Okay, I want to give the audience.